Welcome everyone to our first GTM Talks of 2021. My name is Madison Skidmore. My colleague Brittany and I will be hosting this series. GTM Talks is a virtual lecture series that highlights research and monitoring efforts at the reserve. Each lecture within the series will focus on one of the reserve's management plan goals, which are to improve natural biodiversity, improve water quality, enhance understanding of sea level rise and climate change impacts, improve visitor experiences while minimizing resource damage, and increase awareness of cultural history. Today's lecture will focus on cultural resources and archaeological monitoring. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from. Again, I'm Madison Skidmore from St. Augustine, Florida, and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Brittany, from Jack's Beach, Florida. Hi, everyone. So welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're excited to, to uh, hear about our lecture today. Um, however, before we do get started with that, um, with the introduction of our speaker today, we're going to go over some Zoom etiquette and um, housekeeping. So um, here you can see your um, Zoom control panel um, on your screen. And if you can leave your audio muted throughout the whole presentation, um, we'll have time for questions and such at the end. Um, and then also next to that, you'll also see um, a participants box and that'll basically be able, enable you to be able to raise your hand or um, just provide nonverbal feedback. Uh, also, then you have the chat box as well. And please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, but we will, um, and we'll address those at the end. So now that we are, navigating, know how to navigate the Zoom controls, uh, we will go over to Madison and she will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Brittany. Um, so we are so excited to introduce our speaker today, Chuck Mead, director of the Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program, also known as LAMP, located here in St. Augustine. Chuck will highlight some of the more exciting discoveries made under the sea and in the lab and the Spring Break Shipwreck site that is located within the GTM Research Reserve boundaries. In 1999, LAMP Research Institute was created to provide an active research component supporting the discovery, investigation, and preservation of historic shipwrecks and other maritime archaeological sites. 20 years later, the research program is going strong teaching diving with a focus of underwater archaeology and shipwreck archaeology to high school and college students, along with discovering and excavating shipwrecks dating back to the 1700s in the often murky waters of Northeast Florida. With that being said, we'll hand the presentation over to Chuck. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I gosh, it was maybe a year ago I last spoke uh, in a, uh, a GTM NUR Research Reserve uh, uh, series, and, and uh, it's been a crazy year. Uh, we haven't done all the field work that we would normally do, uh, but hope, we're all hoping that we get back to normal soon. Uh, but this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and St. Augustine has such a wonderful history uh, it's no surprise that being on the ocean and the oldest port in our country, that it has a wonderful maritime history as well. So uh, that is what we are going to be delving in uh, in this uh, talk. Uh, so as you heard, I uh, am employed by the St. Augustine Lighthouse and Maritime Museum. I'm the director of the Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program, or LAMP. Uh, and uh, as you heard, uh, we were founded, gosh, a while ago now in 1999, uh, to focus on maritime archaeology and maritime historical research as part of the museum's mission, uh, which is to discover, preserve, present, and keep alive the stories of our nation's oldest port. And we do all kinds of things at the Lighthouse. We have summer camps and we teach marine science to kids. We have an archaeological field school where we have college-age students. We have uh, a wooden boat building program. We do marine archaeology. We do uh, uh, archival uh, historical research in, in the uh, archives. Uh, so uh, we do all kinds of really exciting things at the Lighthouse and it's a wonderful uh, way 
uh, to do maritime archaeology in a really wonderful place uh, to do it. Uh, so the lighthouse has been supporting underwater archaeology or maritime archaeology uh, from the late 1990s, shortly before they decided to go all in and create LAMP. Uh, this is the uh, field school I mentioned. Uh, this was our first year uh, since I have been here, and I've been here about 15 years, but this unfortunately was our first year that we did not have a field school, and that's when we have our university students who are uh, mostly studying archaeology, but sometimes we get some biologists and other majors. Uh, they'll come here uh, to learn how to do underwater archaeology side by side with the underwater archaeologists from the lighthouse uh, on shipwrecks offshore. Uh, it's a really interesting training program. Uh, field school is, is part of any uh, archaeologist toolkit. That's uh, part of your basic training. Uh, when you're working off St. Augustine, you have really poor visibility. So uh, we do a lot of training in the pool first to keep our divers safe and to keep them effective at working on St. Augustine shipwrecks. And you'll notice a diver here has duct tape over her eyes. So uh, this is to uh, help get our divers uh, uh, trained so they feel comfortable in water where they might not be able to see even an inch. Uh, and you can see we have divers uh, 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 trying to entangle our blind diver with uh, bungee cords. So uh, that's an important part of the training. If you can get yourself out of a mess like you see here with all these tape measures and lines, uh, you're going to be more effective when you're working in low visibility waters and you'll be uh, safer, certainly. Uh, this is our research vessel, uh, the Empire Defender. Uh, it was offshore just today uh, doing some water sampling. Uh, we had a, a, a faculty from uh, Flagler College and uh, FWC representative and uh, some uh, of our colleagues uh, from Blue Ocean Sales. Uh, and so we've been helping them out with water sampling. Uh, but for the most part, we do archeological research uh, with this vessel. Um, when we do archeology span underwater, we are essentially trying to do as good archaeology as we would do on land, to be as precise, uh, to be as careful, as uh, uh, methodical, uh, but it, it can be quite a challenge uh, when you can't see very well. And so, for example, this is uh, one of our grids that you can see here. Uh, the black and white marks are denoting 10 centimeter intervals, which help us take measurements underwater. Uh, and those are not uh, painted onto the PVC, they're put on with black tape so that the diver, if you can't see anything, you could at least still feel uh, 10 centimeter implements. So we have a lot of tricks like that. Uh, and we'll use lines uh, running north-south, uh, making, making sure there are different thickness and lines running east-west so the divers can uh, navigate around with hopefully relative ease, even if they can't see very well. Uh, now, these, uh, believe it or not, are some of the very best visibility we've ever had. So if you see any underwater pictures in my slideshow from St. Uh, St. Augustine Shipwreck, you'll know that that was as good a visibility as we could get, because no, you know, we may go months and months and months without even trying to take a picture because it's so dark. Uh, but you can see the divers here uh, have a line level with a bubble level, so they're measuring elevations to record how how far uh, we have dug, you know, uh, how, how deep we've dug in the sand on that particular dive. Uh, and then on the bottom right, uh, we can take a clipboard and a standard pencil underwater. We just have to have special paper. So with mylar paper or plastic uh, paper, uh, we can make drawings and record uh, our archaeological findings uh, just like we would do on land. Um, this is a shot from a shipwreck uh, that went down in the uh, later 1700s. You'll hear a little more about it, uh, but this is pretty typical. We don't, uh, uh, our, certainly our colonial period wrecks, we don't have kind of an intact hull, uh, but instead we have a scatter of stuff. So in this case, there's uh, a prominent object uh, that is uncovered by dredging. Uh, in an archaeological unit or a one meter by one meter square. Uh, you can see the diver has a dredge hose here. That's a four inch hose uh, that's sucking up the sand like a vacuum cleaner. And that's how we move the sand. Uh, we're careful when we do it. We, you know, once we have an artifact exposed, we don't, we don't just uh, grab it uh, and we don't want to dig too much around it so it slides around. We want to uh, record it in its original location because we're essentially, it's kind of like we're crime scene investigators. We're trying to reconstruct uh, the past by recording exactly what we found, where we found it, and then we can look for patterns, we can look for clues to try to figure out what the heck uh, was going on. Uh, so everything we suck up through that dredge 
uh, get spit out on the other side and we don't want to lose any artifacts, even the smallest of things. So you can see uh, we've got a mesh bag and actually it's a, a set of two uh, doubled up mesh bags at the end of our dredge hose. And so you can see the silt cloud here, the sand uh, kind of coming out the other end and everything we suck up that's bigger than a grain of sand uh, or at least that won't fit through the mesh is collected in these bags. Uh, and then the divers will recover those bags are labeled so we know which unit they come from and how deep under the uh, sand they are. And uh, we have volunteers sort through that dredge spoil and sometimes they find some pretty uh, interesting things. So this is Ed Coward. Uh, he was one of our volunteers and I think his very first week he volunteered at the lighthouse, he found a gold coin uh, in our dredge spoil. So that guy has never quit. He is volunteering to this day uh, for years and years now. So you, ne you never know what you're gonna find. Uh, and a lot of times our big discoveries are not just under the water, but back in the lab, uh, back home. Uh, this is what St. Augustine looked like uh, in 1783. Uh, and uh, it, uh, north is to the right in this picture. So this is kind of, I guess, what St. Augustine would look like if you were coming in, if you were inbound on a sailing vessel. And you'll notice there's big sandbar here and a big sandbar here. And so the, the safe way to get to St. Augustine was to follow that red line. And of course, there was no red line in real life. You just had to make do with uh, what charts you might have. Uh, and it was known this was a pretty dangerous inlet. If you were too far to the right or left, you might run aground on that sandbar. Uh, if you were able to thread the needle, then you could turn around Anastasia Island. Uh, the fort was protecting the harbor, and uh, that's how you got into the safety uh, of our harbor. Uh, that X there, uh, uh, X does mark the spot, uh, at least in a general way, uh, where all of our shipwrecks are. Uh, it's not a surprise that if this is the dangerous part uh, of this process of getting in from the Atlantic Ocean to the inland waterways, uh, this is where you're going to have a lot of shipwrecks in, uh, in and about this sandbar. And of course, the sandbar moves all the time. So even if you have uh, really good nautical charts, uh, at least by 1783 standards, uh, if uh, within a week or two, if a hurricane comes through or a nor'easter, uh, the safe path in can be totally changed and you can have sand uh, shifting and putting a bar in front of you or uh, removing, uh, uh, removing a bar that used to be there. Uh, so it, it can be pretty dangerous uh, getting in. Uh, that point was really uh, hammered home well by a visitor to St. Augustine uh, who was here in 1784, and that was a German, Dr. Johann Schopf. And Schopf was an uh, officer. He was a surgeon in the British Army. So he was here fighting uh, uh, you know, in a Hessian unit uh, 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 in the American Revolution. So he was one of those hated uh, Hessians that the American rebels uh, couldn't stand fighting for the Redcoats. Uh, and he wrote uh, his memoirs, and it's a wonderful account, kind of a good natural history account of uh, what St. Augustine was like in 1784, and he published it a few years later. Um, and he gives a really vivid account of what it was like to get into St. Augustine. The sandbar before St. Augustine is unquestionably the most dangerous. It is indeed a fearful thing to hear the wild tumult of these breaking seas and to behold them on all sides, foaming and tossing. It has become so common at St. Augustine to see ships aground on this bar that disasters of the sort have almost ceased to arouse either sympathy or wonder. Without the least overstatement, I dare say that every 100 paces you walk on the beach, the skeleton of a foundered ship or its wreckage may be seen. Who could pass this way without emotion? If one imagines to himself the terror so many souls must have suffered here and the lives that have been here lost. The estimate is that every fortnight to a month at the most, a vessel is wrecked on this coast. Should the sea withdraw after centuries, it would be an astounding thing to come upon the relics of these ships. So we cannot part the seas like Moses, but we can go beneath the sea. And that's what we do at LAMP uh, to try to better understand the ships that have wrecked in this very dangerous port, uh, this port that has been around longer than any other American port. So uh, these shipwrecks are essentially a database. They're a record of maritime history that goes all the way back 
uh, at least to the founding of St. Augustine in 1565. And today, uh, I'm going to address uh, a, a kind of a multitude of shipwrecks, give a kind of a whirlwind tour, uh, and we'll actually start on the beach. We'll start on shore. So remember, uh, Shope said that you couldn't walk a uh, hundred paces without coming across the old wooden bones of a shipwreck. Well, every once in a while, uh, we get that uh, in our modern age. And this was a wonderful example uh, uh, back in March of 2018 during uh, so when, when the local high schools had spring break and a lot of uh, uh, colleges uh, had uh, students visiting here for spring break, this shipwreck also decided to pay us a visit. Uh, this was a 50 foot long section of a wooden hull. Uh, it came ashore uh, and caused quite the hullabaloo. Uh, there were a lot of people uh, who were excited to see this kind of uh, unexpected gift from Mother Nature. Uh, we had the Sheriff's Department called us and said there's like a thousand to three thousand cars a day trying to park on A1A and cut through people's yard trying to get in to see the shipwreck and they told us you got to do something about the shipwreck uh, and we were doing everything we could. There's only so much you can do with tons of wet wood that suddenly shows up. Uh, but you can see we did a lot of great public outreach as well as kind of emergency archaeology to try to record uh, this find. And it was quite a well-preserved uh, section of a hull, uh, part of the side of a sailing ship. Uh, we could certainly tell it was a pretty big sailing ship, pretty sizable. Uh, you know, at the time, our estimates now are still the same as probably our first rough estimates. Uh, it may have been as long as uh, between 100 and 150, 160 feet, something like that. And everything we've seen on it seems to uh, keep us somewhere in that size range. So pretty uh, robust timbers. Uh, and a, a, a shipwreck like this that has gone from an underwater context uh, to a dry land context uh, in, a, in a pretty you know, sudden uh, event uh, does face uh, some dangers. Uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, danger from the sun and the air. Now, now, sometimes we have wreckage that has been buried on the beach for decades or centuries and it's under a sand dune and then a nor'easter comes and wipes away a bunch of the sand dune and then you can see this wooden wreckage that has been on the beach already. Uh, but then sometimes you have a nor'easter come through and it's ripped something up from offshore where it was buried and then cast it ashore. And that's what happened here with the spring break wreck. Well, you can see uh, on day one, uh, when you look at these timbers, you can see the wood grain. Uh, it's quite beautiful, actually. Uh, you know, maritime archeologists love wood. Uh, that's just kind of comes with the territory. Uh, but uh, the wood is preserved in very good shape. Uh, and then just uh, two weeks later, look at the wood. Look how cracked it is as the water is drying out. Uh, the, the cellulose that gives the cell wall uh, strength and rigidity has basically been leached away uh, by the ocean over a, a hundred years or so. And so the water is kind of holding the cells together. So it looks like it's in great shape, but as that water leaves uh, by evaporating, it begins to crack and shrivel and crumble the wood. Uh, take a look uh, at day 23. Look how bad uh, that wood is. It's almost like pa uh, you know pages in a book uh, that are just being peeled back uh, layer by layer. Uh, and and I have you know heard today as we knew that you know the wreck is in somewhat rough shape. It's it's just it's the nature of the beast. Uh, we would never recover a big giant section of a, a, a waterlogged wooden ship like this unless we had the resources to preserve it in the laboratory. And a piece this big would take, I mean, you could spend a million dollars on this or more. Uh, you'd have to have like a swimming pool size vat to store it in, you have to keep it wet, and then you'd have to replace that lost cellulose with a, a specific chemical. So it takes a lot of treatment uh, to, to do it right. And so unfortunately, the only thing we could really do to try to save this shipwreck, or at least save the knowledge we can learn from the shipwreck, was to do good archaeological recording as fast as we could. And so that, that was our goal. Uh, at the same time, there was also a threat to this shipwreck from the surf, from the water. Uh, at low tide, it was high and dry, dry on the beach. But as high tide came, it got beat by the surf and actually moved around. Uh, in fact, uh, it got uh, torn to pieces to a certain degree. Uh, from being beaten up by the surf. And the first day we saw it, when we came back the next day, it had moved more than 150 feet, I think, down the beach. Um, so we actually, uh, these are two three-dimensional models that we made of the shipwreck. And they, uh, uh, we made one on day one and one on day two. 
And if you look up at day one, uh, all of these uh, ribs here uh, that go up and down here and some of these rows of planking, they're all missing. They were all up here. Uh, so a good, uh, you know, maybe almost a third of the ship or a quarter of the, uh, of the wreckage that we had on day one was just torn away. So we didn't really have uh, too much of a choice. We just had to record this as, as well as we could. Uh, here's the drawings we made. And again, if we compare day one uh, with day two, uh, I, I can make a, go back and forth. Uh, but a, a lot of the wood uh, disappeared overnight. Uh, and so we lost some information that we might have otherwise had. Um, we were able uh, to uh, kind of stop that cycle of destruction uh, and get uh, the wreckage uh, brought up and brought to the research reserve where it still is uh, outside by the trailhead on display. And again, it's not the ideal situation. Uh, the ship is still exposed to the elements, but uh, there really wasn't a choice. This, this was the best choice we had to preserve what we have. And we do like that people can see the wreck. Now, so visitors to the research reserve can see the shipwreck, and that's a, a, a really great thing. Um, there are a lot of really neat little idiosyncrasies uh, on this shipwreck that we were able to note. And again, a lot of these things are have been erased at this point because of uh, the degradation of the wood. Uh, but you can see here uh, these marks. Uh, these are Roman numerals, uh, and they were carved by the shipwrights themselves, the folks who built this ship. And so uh, it's uh, it's upside down. Uh, at least, you know, the ship is right side up, but uh, it was probably uh, scratched in before this timber was added to the ship or, you know, attached to the ship. Uh, but there are two X's, uh, where's my mouse, uh, XX and then one, two, three, four. So that is frame 24, or uh, a, a segment of uh, frame 24. Uh, so if we look on our map here, uh, here's 24 here. So that's uh, one of these uh, two. Uh, uh, futtocks, uh, shipbuilders would call them, two parts of the rib or the frame, uh, the framing system of the ship. Um, we literally had square pegs and round holes, so that was one of the uh, fun aspects of this shipwreck. There were some really uh, strange, interesting things, and we think these pegs were put in to help temporarily hold uh, the frames in place uh, until they could be uh, uh, securely uh, bolted and attached. Uh, and so uh, that's just kind of a, a, an artifact of the shipbuilding process. Um, we went through and labeled every part to try to understand every part of the ship. Uh, we eventually uh, were able to determine, uh, uh, you know, that if we were on the port or starboard side uh, and that we knew where the water line was, so we knew what part of the ship was underwater. So we began to uh, get a better orientation of uh, what this uh, ship looked like. Uh, we had a number of tool marks. Uh, so this is a, a, a plank on the upper or the inner portion of the hull. And you can see these round marks here from a big mallet. So probably a big wooden mallet that was used to hammer that plank and get it nice and tight where it needed to be so they could fit the next plank in place. Uh, we also have marks that helped us date the shipwreck. So this, uh, these marks here, these are saw marks from a, a band saw. Uh, and then we also have saw marks from a circular saw. So uh, this is telling us that uh, these are steam powered uh, saws. So steam powered sawmills uh, uh, worked the wood uh, that was used for this shipwreck. And then we have hand tools as well. Uh, but that tells us this ship uh, probably would not have been built before about the 1880s because uh, the steam powered bandsaw, uh, bandsaws existed earlier, but they weren't very reliable. Uh, the bands kept on breaking. So, um, so that helped us date the ship. Uh, we also collected uh, a lot of uh, specimens uh, from the different timbers. Uh, you know, our first job is to kind of figure out what timber is what, and then uh, we wanted to, you know, better understand uh, the timbers and what wood they were made with. So we had 20 wood, uh, 21 wood samples uh, analyzed by Dr. Lee Newsom at Flagler College, uh, and that was pretty interesting. Um, we, we saw that the, uh, the, the components of the ribs or the frames were uh, pairs of uh, hardwood, uh, uh, softwood, and hardwood, so alternating. So there was a, a pattern that the shipwrights used. Uh, they used uh, American beech and um, uh, pine. Uh, so actually, uh, I think they, there was southern yellow pine in the planking, but these frames were actually white pine. Uh, and so we... Uh, before we realized we had white pine and southern pine, we thought uh, it was probably built in the south. Uh, now we're thinking uh, maybe in kind of more like the mid-Atlantic, so kind of the mid-south. 
Um, and you can see here's the range of yellow pine. American beech is all over the place. The white pine comes down, does come down into uh, the Carolinas here. Uh, and so we think that's likely that we may have been built in the Carolinas. Uh, and uh, we're, we're still going over our, our data and trying to, uh, you know, analyze and reanalyze uh, what we found from this shipwreck. Uh, and this is kind of a reconstruction of uh, what a cross section of the ship might have looked like, uh, showing where the section of the hull uh, that we found would have been on the original ship. So you can see here, uh, here is uh, the section uh, uh, we found looked, looking at it as if you were looking straight down along, uh, along it, so kind of a, a front to back view of it. And uh, we have scaled uh, this cross section of a, uh, a similar time period uh, vessel uh, and it fit pretty well. Uh, so we think we have the curvature uh, of the turn of the bilge right here. Here's where the water line is. And again, we could tell on our specimen uh, because of the copper sheathing used on the outside of the hull to keep shipworms from eating up uh, your ship, because uh, that's a bad thing. Uh, and the sheathing was gone, but the tack holes, uh, the, the tacks that held the sheathing in place, some of the tacks were still there and we could see the tack holes. Um, we could tell from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the lack of, uh, you know, the, the condition of the timbers and the fact that she had never been resheathed, uh, you know, we only had the original tack holes, uh, that this uh, ship was relatively new when it wrecked, uh, probably wrecked sometime, therefore, in the 1880s, maybe, uh, maybe 1890s, uh, again, somewhere around 100 to 150 uh, feet long, a pretty sizable vessel of a few hundred tons. Uh, you know, kind of ship that might have been carrying lumber or something like that. We had a lot of those going up and down our coast. Um, in fact, here's another one. Uh, you know, this is a, a, the most recent find we have made. This is another beached shipwreck. Uh, this one we call the Crescent Beach Wreck because that's where it was found. Uh, and we, we heard, we got phone calls one day about a new shipwreck on the beach and we went out there and sure enough, lo and behold, uh, there it was uh, on the beach. So this is one that was buried in the sand dune and uh, because of, you know, uh, probably climate change related weather patterns, uh, we have a lot more powerful storms uh, that, than we have had traditionally and maybe 10 feet of the sand dune was wiped out by hurricanes Matthew and Irma, and then a nor'easter did the rest of the job and this shipwreck began to peek out uh, from under the sand. So uh, we have, uh, we went out, uh, recorded what was there, did a little digging. Uh, I'm happy to say that this uh, mother nature has reburied this wreck. So that as, as you saw before, that will help protect uh, this shipwreck. Uh, and it's been there for a really long time. Uh, and so we expect it'll stay there for a long time if it stays undisturbed, if it stays buried, but you know, who knows, it may be exposed again. Um, and this one probably dates to the 1880s as well, uh, we believe. And uh, it, it may be a ship called the Caroline Eddy uh, that was carrying lumber and wrecked uh, near the Matanzas Inlet, which is quite close to where we are uh, in August of 1880. Um, the steamship uh, ballast pile wreck is uh, an interesting site, and this is one of the few uh, days of good visibility we had. Uh, uh, this we know is a steamship because there's a big steam engine, and that's what you're looking at here on the left side of the uh, picture. These uh, uh, Cadipterus fobber, the spade fish, uh, love it, and, and we have some uh, giant uh, Goliath grouper who uh, hang out there as well. So uh, we, we, of course, dived this ship for years before we even realized there were any fish on it because we couldn't see anything most of the time we were there. Um, and, and this is what the site would look like if you could see underwater. Uh, we have a big engine, steam engine. That's what you saw in the previous picture. Uh, there's a very large boiler uh, right next to it. If you go back to the way uh, in uh, uh, the stern area of the ship, we have the propeller. That's a helpful item to find. It lets us know which way our ship is pointed. And then we have the ballast pile uh, to one side. Uh, and that's a pile of rocks. Uh, they're used usually on sailing ships to provide weight in the hull. And so there has, we have speculated that this might be a site uh, of two shipwrecks. So there may have been a sailing ship that collided with a steamship, and then they both wrecked, or there may have been, uh, you know, one of them might have wrecked, and then the other one ran into that wreck. Uh, but we think it's, it's likely enough uh, that there are two shipwrecks here. Now, it's possible uh, that this is still just one wreck site, and maybe a, a section of the hull kind of broke off 
and is a little bit out of place and you might have used stone ballast on a steamship you know normally you wouldn't need to because the boiler and the coal and the engine are so heavy you don't need that uh, uh, ballast but you might need a little bit of ballast to, to trim the vessel or something like that um, here on the bottom uh, is a sonar image of this shipwreck and so again you can see the same features i just pointed out uh, the boiler the engine uh, the sonar is great. You can see fish, uh, you know, huge school of fish, uh, even the propeller sticking up out of the sand there, and then more archaeological drawings of what we're looking at. And it does look like uh, the, the, either the keel has broken uh, because the, the boiler uh, and the engine and propeller don't quite match up. So we, we do know there was a uh, steamship called the Cricket. Uh, I, I think it wrecked in 1869 and it broke its back. Uh, on the sandbar. So it's possible we have the cricket, but we're really, uh, you know, we don't have any definitive evidence yet. Um, when this site was first discovered uh, back in 96, uh, 95, I think it was, uh, before LAMP was around, uh, the archaeologists were very interested in the machinery. Uh, the archaeologists who found it uh, went on to found LAMP, uh, my predecessor, and so these were drawings done uh, under uh, uh, LAMP operation. Uh, so to try to better understand the technology of the vessel. Uh, and then when I first got here in uh, 2006, uh, by, the, uh, by our 2009 field season, uh, our, our focus was to dig a trench across the ballast pile to see if we had the remains of wooden vessel underneath, and we did. Uh, you can see the wooden uh, uh, frames and the planking and that kind of thing. Uh, so kind of imagine the spring break wreck uh, if it were buried uh, in the mud with a big pile of rocks on it. We have something similar uh, to that. Uh, this is another shipwreck and we are hoping to get back out uh, to this one and take another look at it. Uh, this one we call the centerboard schooner wreck uh, because it's most likely a centerboard schooner uh, that dates to the late 1800s. Uh, this is a sonar image of it on the top right, and you can see uh, essentially what's a big pile of barrels. So this ship had uh, wooden barrels that were full of cement, and when the ship wrecked, the barrels got wet, so they turned to hard cement, and then the wood part of the barrels rotted away, and you have all these kind of casts of barrels made out of cement, uh, which is a really interesting thing to dive on. This is a, a really neat wreck. Uh, the, the wooden hole is underneath. Uh, the pile, there's a pile uh, uh, on one side uh, and a pile uh, on the other side of the centerboard. So if you dig down in between, you'll see wooden uh, ribs or frames and you'll see uh, a centerboard, which is a big slab of wood that could be lowered down into the water if you needed a deep keel for deep water sailing, or it could be pulled up out of the water if you were trying to get in the St. Augustine Inlet and you knew you, were, you had shallow shoals ahead of you and you didn't want to be deep. So uh, a versatile ship, uh, this is you know, probably the same similar time period to the Spring Break wreck. Spring Break might have been a similar uh, ship to this one again, uh, and it was carrying uh, uh, cement uh, probably to St. Augustine. This may have been right around the time of the Henry Flagler uh, building boom, uh, and he made all his hotels out of uh, cement cast into uh, big blocks. Uh, and so they needed a lot of cement. And you know, so maybe right before the railroad, railroad was completed, uh, ships like this would have been pretty important to bring in building supplies. Uh, the industry uh, is our oldest ship off St. Augustine. Uh, the industry is a really, uh, this was an exciting one. It was discovered in 1997 and uh, there was some uh, good uh, uh, documentary research uh, that was done. So we have some documents uh, uh, historical documents related to this. And uh, we quote uh, at the bottom here, uh, a letter from uh, the military commander here in St. Augustine. I am extremely sorry to acquaint you that the industry transport commanded by Captain Lawrence was unfortunately cast away off the bar at St. Augustine on the 6th. Uh, and, and so it's great to have a paper trail and to actually be able to identify uh, your shipwreck by name. It's, it's not always that easy to do so. Uh, this was discovered by the same archaeology group, SOAR, uh, that existed before LAMP, and they also found the, the steamship wreck and the centerboard schooner, actually. Uh, this site had a number of cannons, so there's one, two, three, four, five, uh, and there were three more uh, guns when it was originally found. Uh, there's some anchors. Uh, they're actually, you'll see they only have one arm each, so these are mooring anchors, so they were meant to be set up 
in St. Augustine's Harbor so that ships could tie up to a buoy, uh, just like we have mooring balls today for sailboats uh, out in the water. Uh, there were uh, grinding stones and uh, weaponry uh, like the cannons and this little mini cannon and uh, ammunition for the cannons and a lot of tools. So uh, this was a supply ship that was coming to St. Augustine uh, the very uh, second year, the year after St. Augustine went from Spanish control to British control. And so the British were bringing in supplies that their garrison needed uh, for the new colony. So it's a very interesting shipwreck for archaeologists to look at. And these are all artifacts that uh, for many years were on display at our museum uh, at the lighthouse. Uh, you can see a box of axes. Uh, it actually was labeled, uh, it said number five, Illinois axes, 20. And, in, and if you counted them, indeed, there were 20 axes in there. Uh, the cannon uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, our group raised uh, and the little mini cannon, the swivel gun, the kind of a one-man cannon, uh, cooking pots, grinding stones, tea kettles, the, the British love their tea, and uh, saw, uh, saw handles, hand saw handles that look just like, you know, what you might have in your garage uh, today. Uh, the, the weaponry had uh, diagnostic markings, so markings that uh, gives us information. Uh, this is the weight of the gun here. Uh, now that's not the system we use. They uh, they used hundred weights, quarter weights, and pounds. So it comes out to be around 1900, I think 1962 pounds. Uh, uh, this gun fired a six pound cannonball. Uh, it has a what they call the broad arrow. That is a marker uh, that tells us that it belonged to the British government. Uh, and then the uh, King George the Second crest uh, kind of does the same thing. Tells us this was a royal cannon. Uh, so again, it was part of the supplies that we know were being sent here in 1764. And then here's the uh, just beautiful piece, uh, very rare to find something like this, but the wooden crate that had axes in it. Uh, this is how it looked on the top left uh, when it was first found. Uh, and then uh, again, if we had let this dry out, we would have lost it completely. It would have just cracked to pieces. Uh, but it was conserved in a laboratory. And while you lost some of the uh, the distinct, you know, you can't quite read the, the writing as well, but it's still there and it's now stable and will be preserved. Uh, so that was really amazing. And you can see how the axes looked when that box was first opened uh, by the archaeologists. Uh, and then, of course, they kept everything wet. And then here are the axes now that can be dried out because they've been conserved in the laboratory. Um, we had an unfortunate incident with this shipwreck. Uh, and to me, it's a reminder that our ships are always in danger and not just from natural causes. Uh, but there were a group of looters, probably professional treasure hunters, who came uh, in the middle of the night, uh, blew a hole on the shipwreck using their propeller. So this is a photograph uh, probably from the Florida Keys or somewhere in clear water where you can see these big uh, devices that uh, uh, basically deflect the propeller wash from the vessel straight down to the seafloor. And it, you can see from the sand cloud, it digs a lot of sand. Uh, well, it, it blew a hole probably 20 feet across, uh, maybe 10 feet deep on the shipwreck and displaced a lot of artifacts. We don't even know what uh, we lost, except we do know that two of the cannons were stolen. Uh, so that was really unfortunate. And, but, you know, and, and the perpetrators have never been caught. Uh, but, uh, like I said, uh, these shipwrecks are protected by law, and there is still a threat. Uh, you know, people will still try to uh, steal things off them, loot things off them. And you can imagine digging that much sand at once is very different than how we dig with our dredges going a few centimeters at a time. Uh, that's just uh, not the way you do, do good science. A lot of information was lost uh, because of that activity. Uh, now, this is one of the shipwrecks that we discovered uh, in 2015. So uh, it's named the Anniversary Wreck because, of course, that was the 450th anniversary of St. Augustine's existence as a city. Uh, this is my uh, colleague, Brendan Burke, said this was our birthday present to the city of St. Augustine. Uh, and it was an exciting discovery. Uh, it dates, as you can see, to sometime in the second half of the 1700s, uh, 1765 to 1800. Uh, and we, uh, we, we didn't do any digging this summer, of course, because of COVID, uh, but the summer before we were working on this wreck. And we found all kinds of interesting artifacts like the shoe buckle that you see here and broken pottery. And of course, pottery can often uh, help archeologists date a site. Uh, that's British pottery that dates 
1740s, maybe 1750s uh, through, uh, through the 1800s, even if they still use stuff like that into the 1900s. Uh, this is a 3D model we were able to create of this site. And we were able to do this because we were blessed with very good visibility the first year we found this shipwreck, uh, 2016, when we, uh, uh, the first year we did a major excavation. And so this is basically uh, hundreds of photographs uh, taken, you know, still shots from video camera that have been put together. Uh, and uh, we can actually rotate this image and see it uh, from side view, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's a, a, a really neat technology that uh, didn't exist a few years before. And it doesn't always work for us because if we can't take good pictures underwater, we can't uh, generate a three-dimensional image uh, of the wreck site. Uh, this was our drawing, so we, we kind of did our old school recording as well as the new high tech recording. And basically, uh, we have a, a scatter of material. Uh, so we have a number of uh, barrels that you can see here, 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 and here. We have uh, cauldrons or cooking pots stacked together uh, here, 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 here. There's a lot of cooking pots. So this uh, clearly seems to be a merchant ship that was bringing in cargo to St. Augustine and iron pots, iron cauldrons were one thing that people needed uh, to make their meals in. And so that's the kind of thing you would expect would be coming in to St. Augustine. And uh, again, we had really good visibility uh, that year. So we got some great images and you can see one of them right there. Um, we have a, a number of them uh, uh, covered in concretion and shell like is typical when we have iron uh, underwater and of course we can clean that in the laboratory. Um, I mentioned the brown, uh, uh, the uh, salt glaze stoneware, the brown stoneware, typically British, uh, sometimes European, the, uh, the Germans made this stuff as well, but we, we see this in St. Augustine, it's usually British. Uh, the shoe buckle you saw, uh, uh, pewter plates and also cut stone. So this was interesting, maybe building supplies for St. Augustine and uh, again, other than uh, coquina, we don't really have a natural stone uh, for building with, so they would have brought in uh, stone uh, blocks like this. Uh, here's one of those pewter plates. Uh, we actually have recently made a discovery in the lab. We found a maker's mark on one of these plates. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the, the guy who made this, like, you know, Paul Revere made uh, silver uh, uh, objects, silverware. Uh, pewter smiths would put their mark in just like you would find on uh, the back of a silver uh, piece. And uh, it, it's hard to read. It's so faded, we can't quite tell what it is. We have a few theories, but hopefully we'll be able to figure it out and that will give us an, a, a nice date range. Uh, but other objects have been giving us dates. So uh, this is a type of ceramic known as uh, creamware. And this particular edge style, the feathered edge, uh, 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 helps date it to between 1765 and 1790s. Uh, we can get down to brass tacks. We found pins and tacks on this shipwreck. Uh, brass doorknobs. Uh, there's one in an x-ray. So a lot of times we find a concretion uh, like this object at the top and it'll have things inside that we see in the x-ray. So here's a great example of uh, kind of a before cleaning and then an x-ray shot. And then after we clean it, we'll separate out. Uh, this is the key plate right here. Uh, you'll be able to see that uh, once it's conserved, it'll probably go in our museum. So this is the kind of thing we often find on the seafloor. If you didn't know any better, you would not realize this was a man-made object or you know, probably a number of man-made objects that had been rusted over and formed this hard uh, substance uh, from the minerals in the seawater and the rust corrosion process. Uh, but when you x-ray it, you can see all kinds of things. Uh, we have lead shot, all these tiny little white balls here and here. So we have hundreds of uh, tiny lead pellets. Uh, we have a lot of spikes. So you can see these na big nails or spikes here. Uh, this little round headed uh, uh, tack, that's one of those copper tacks and we have a number of those. And it was harder to see, so I outlined them in red. We had another key uh, escutcheon or a uh, key plate uh, and an actual key as well uh, in, in this object. And so you can imagine that takes a lot of time in our laboratory to clean all of that and to uh, then do the chemical treatments that's needed to preserve it all. Uh, we found some uh, botanical remains as well, which is pretty neat. We have an olive pit uh, from this shipwreck and a number of peach pits. 
Uh, and so I'm always worried when we are out on our dive boat, uh, when it's lunchtime, I don't want anyone to throw their uh, uh, you know, apple cores overboard because if we find an apple seed, we'll get really excited. So when we, I first uh, heard from the lab, they said, hey, did you know we found peach pits in the dread spoil? And I'm like, oh, that's pretty amazing. And then I'm like, oh gosh, I hope it's not from someone's lunch. And we tell our students and our visitors like never throw anything overboard, put it all in the trash, even if it's biodegradable. Uh, but they told me, well, there's no way it was from someone's lunch because there were 13 of them and they were all in the same unit, the same meter square unit. So that would take someone who ate a lot of peaches and throwing them all in the exact same place. Uh, so that's a pretty exciting find, I, I, I think. A peach from the uh, you know, 1760s, 1770s, that's you know, George Washington's time. So uh, pretty amazing. And, and we'll see, you, know, you never know, uh, there may be some kind of DNA analysis or something we can do uh, uh, from that. Um, one of the things we do uh, on our shipwrecks, uh, we didn't used to, I wish we always had, but we collect sediment samples and then we sort through uh, those samples uh, and get down to the nitty gritty of what is in the sand matrix uh, surrounding our artifacts. So you can see these different screens, uh, uh, the, you know, the tiniest things are in the tiny screen. And we have uh, uh, a PhD student at the University of Arkansas who was going through, he was sorting this stuff for us and going through it. And he found all kinds of amazing things, bugs and critters on our ship when it was a sailing vessel. Uh, so sometimes he can identify them by species, uh, sometimes he can't, uh, but believe it or not, we've had beetle parts, we've had ant parts, we've had uh, the jaw of a spider, uh, we've had a mouse toenail, we've had all kinds of tiny, tiny little remains. It sounds like a witch's brew at, at Halloween, you know, with the eye of newt and uh, uh, throwing a little mouse toenail. But uh, it's pretty amazing that these things were on our ship. Uh, and this was just, you know, it speaks to the hygiene uh, that was just taken for granted in the 1700s. Uh, but these critters were uh, infesting the food stores, they were infesting cargo items. Uh, we have hide beetles. Uh, uh, things that would have been in the flour, things that would have been in, uh, you know, organic cargo items uh, that are preserved uh, e even after 230 years on the seafloor. Uh, so it's really amazing uh, the amount of stuff uh, that we found, uh, uh, you know, this, this level of looking into our shipwreck. And again, it also makes you, again, uh, really understand when those treasure hunters hit the industry shipwreck and they just blew a ton of sand away, there's no telling what else was lost uh, when they did that, but certainly a lot of information that could have been, uh, could have been gained by our, a good archeological study. And then this is uh, my last shipwreck uh, of, of uh, today, uh, the storm wreck. This is a really fun one, uh, has a great history. This was a refugee ship. Uh, so at the end of the American Revolution, uh, this vessel had people who were evacuating the city of Charleston. Uh, they wanted to get the heck out of Dodge uh, because of the war and because they did not feel they would be welcome in the new United States of America uh, because they were loyal to King George. So these are loyalists. These are the other guys, uh, not the Americans or the rebels that we usually think of uh, during the war. Um, we discovered this shipwreck in 2009. Uh, we excavated uh, for uh, a good five years, uh, six years, and uh, again, uh, we have a scatter of objects, so kind of similar to the anniversary wreck, uh, but a lot of material, a lot of concretions that we, you know, again, we don't know what they are until we x-ray them, uh, but this, uh, we recovered a lot of artifacts uh, from the shipwreck, uh, and we were able to piece together, we don't know the ship's name, but we know everything else about it. We know it was part of this fleet that was carrying uh, refugees, uh, 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 soldiers and civilians from Charleston, trying to get into St. Augustine because St. Augustine was still a loyal British colony. Uh, you can see here, we did find the ship's bell. Uh, we were pretty excited. We thought the name of the ship might be on it and we cleaned it in a big event at the museum in front of everybody. And of course, there was nothing on the bell. Uh, it was the generic Walmart special of ship's bells, unfortunately for us. Uh, but people still really enjoyed it. Uh, they, uh, you know, a lot of folks came up, uh, had almost had tears in their eyes and said they had never seen uh, 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 something at a museum so exciting. And, and that's the process, process that is usually behind closed laboratory doors. So it's great uh, to, to get people excited about history uh, through this shipwreck. Uh, now this image 
uh, is kind of a sneak peek uh, of a documentary that is going to appear on the National Geographic channel. Uh, we are going to be uh, on an episode of Drain the Oceans, if you've ever seen that show. And so I had to get permission from National Geographic because they're pretty stingy with their images. Uh, but uh, this is a, a 3D model they created from our data uh, of the bottom of the ocean floor on our shipwreck. And so this gives you a pretty good feeling of what our site looked like, especially if you could actually see it. Because again, uh, we usually didn't have very good visibility here, but you can see a pile of cannons and a lot of other scattered artifacts. Uh, this, this site had a lot of stuff. Um, you, you know, real quickly here, here's an x-ray of a pistol, a uh, shoe buckle, uh, iron tea kettle, a brick, uh, the handle of a knife, a pewter spoon, a button, broken pottery, a cooking cauldron, cannonballs, uh, the bottom of a wine glass, a uh, pewter plate, uh, another buckle, another pewter spoon, and then this one here is a great one, the oldest barbecue grill in the state of Florida, uh, ladies and gentlemen, right here on our shipwreck. Uh, so a lot of stuff from the shipwreck, it's, it was beginning to paint a picture for us uh, as to the time period of the ship and the nationality of the ship. We had a lot of British things. We had a lot of items that dated to the 1700s. Some we thought we could date to the second half of the 1700s. Some we thought we could date to the very end of the 1700s. So we were beginning to get a feeling for what we had. Uh, when we discovered the cannons on the ship, uh, which was in December of 2010, our first season of excavation, uh, we came back the following year uh, because when we didn't have a name or a date on the bell, we figured the cannons were our next best bet. And so this is a carronade, a small stubby cannon uh, that was invented during the American Revolution. So that helped date our uh, ship right there. Uh, and uh, it was a nine pounder. That means it fired a nine pound cannonball. And when we cleaned it off, sure enough, there on its side were the numbers 1780, 1780. Uh, this cannon was cast in 1780, and uh, it also has 9P for 9-pounder. Uh, this really helped us uh, you know, become convinced that we probably had uh, one of these refugee ships. Uh, we knew 16 of them had wrecked in 1782. Now, we didn't have any good evidence uh, uh, to, to really prove that we, this was the, uh, you know, that we, we were part of this fleet, that this ship was uh, uh, from that event. Uh, and then we found this button here. Uh, and it has the letters RP on it and a crown, and that stands for Royal Provincials. And so that is a unit in the British Army made up of loyalists, of Americans who are loyal to King George. So this button told us we had loyalists on our ship, which we were suspecting was a loyalist shipwreck. So that was pretty exciting for us. And then we found this button. It has a 71. That stands for the 71st Regiment. That's a Scottish regiment in the British Royal Army. And the 71st Regiment, uh, they fought at the Battle of Cowpens. They fought at the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, the ones who did not surrender and weren't captured or weren't killed at Yorktown made it back to Charleston and they evacuated from the city of Charleston on the last fleet to evacuate Charleston, which was the same fleet that lost 16 ships in St. Augustine. So this button uh, really gave us compelling evidence that we had one of these refugee ships. And uh, in addition to the Royal Provincial button, we found several more. Uh, we have our 71st button, uh, the 3rd American Regiment, another provincial unit that was on that fleet. The 63rd Regiment was on that fleet as well. And the 30th Regiment was on that fleet. So we are, are certainly convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt, we have one of these uh, ships that was carrying soldiers and civilians uh, from Charleston to St. Augustine. Uh, it was a massive effort. More than 10,000 people were evacuated, so you can imagine that's a lot of ships. Uh, this fleet went to many different places, so some ships went to England, some went to Canada. We had the ships coming to Florida. We had ships going to Jamaica and St. Lucia. Uh, we have great documents uh, of these vessels, so here's our 71st Regiment and our 63rd Regiment, so we know uh, a lot about these ships. Uh, the only problem is uh, the page uh, was missing that would tell us the names of the ships coming to Florida. So I could give you the names of the ships going to Jamaica or to St. Lucia or to London, but I don't have a single name of the ship that was coming to Florida. So that's, uh, you know, that's archaeology for you. Sometimes there's uh, holes in the, in the historical record. Uh, we had weapons. These are x-rays of uh, British military muskets. 
Uh, they were loaded, as you can see here, uh, with what they call buck and ball, so a big musket ball and three buckshot. And then this one was loaded with those lead pellets that you saw before, uh, almost like birdshot or a shotgun shell. So they, they were certainly uh, ready for enemy privateers. Uh, we found all kinds of objects, including three gold coins. Uh, this is the only gold that has ever been found on any shipwreck that I've worked on in a 30-year career. So it's pretty rare to find this stuff. People don't like to leave it behind. Uh, cookware, uh, like this uh, cauldron, or sorry, uh, the, co the uh, tea kettle uh, that you saw concreted before. Here's what it looks like cleaned off. Uh, clothing irons, uh, 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 drawer pulls from furniture, uh, shoe buckles. Again, uh, these people were leaving their homes, so they were bringing what they could with them. This is a door lock. Uh, we even have the key that fit this lock was saved inside the lock. So this person took the lock off his door, wrapped it up in burlap, and there's a little bit of the burlap remaining, uh, and then brought it with him. Uh, a fake watch. Who, who knew that was a thing, but you could get a fake Rolex uh, in George Washington's time. Uh, that was a really interesting find. You can see the, the hands uh, and the Roman numerals 1 through 12, but these hands couldn't move. They were cast into the pewter. So that, that was a pretty interesting find. Uh, and, and then I will leave you with this last uh, quote, which is a really uh, poignant one, I think, uh, about these refugees. November in London. Dark, damp, heavy. No wonder people hang themselves in winter. I spend my days as in a dream, thinking of the little cottage I left behind. We are aliens here. What I would give right now for a Carolina peach. You know, this certainly makes me think of what it's like, uh, say, right now in Florida, where it's nice and warm and the rest of the country has been going through an ice storm. Uh, but it, it, it certainly you know, really puts, I think, a human connection on, on to the artifacts that we found, this, this litter of people's lives and dreams that is left behind when they had to get out of their homes as quickly as they could. And right before uh, getting to a port of salvation, they lost everything. And what it was like for these people to, to have to move on, to go somewhere else, to live their lives somewhere that really would have been alien. You know, they, we, we think these people were English, the people we fought against in the American Revolution, but of course, they were Americans who just chose to fight for crown and country. Uh, and so, you know, it really, for me, tied together all the artifacts and made it uh, uh, kind of personal, uh, which is always fun if you're an archeologist to kind of feel that connection. Uh, that is the last slide. I know I've, I've uh, talked a lot, so uh, I, uh, I hope all of you aren't uh, brain dead, but if anyone has any questions, I'd, I'd love uh, to take them. But otherwise, uh, thank you, everybody, uh, so much. Thank you, Chuck. We do have thank a few you. questions here. Okay. And yeah, so I saw on here that Oliver had asked, let me scroll up here. Um, how do you determine what is worth preserving? Well, that's a great question, Oliver. Um, and, you know, from a sheer, uh, uh, you know, as far as archaeological ethics are concerned, it, everything is important. Everything is potentially uh, a, a piece of the puzzle, something that could give us that clue. Uh, on the other hand, it's really expensive to preserve everything. So we can't always, you know, the spring break wreck is a perfect example. You know, we would not have brought up a big section of ship if I didn't have $5 million in my foundation to preserve it. Um, with the storm wreck, we brought up a lot of material. And once we x-ray it, sometimes we have, uh, believe it or not, we've actually put stuff back on the shipwreck site. So we, all of the artifacts that I showed you from that wreck are very unique objects. They're objects that have the potential to give us some clue, a date or a nationality or something like that. But sometimes we, uh, you know, we'll x-ray a concretion and there's nothing in it but nails. And we already have tens of thousands of nails uh, that we have brought up from the shipwreck. So if we don't need to spend, you know, the, I mean, uh, really thousands of man hours and, uh, you know, uh, power, uh, electrical power uh, to do electrolysis and the chemical supplies are expensive. Uh, if we have something like that, uh, our conservators go through it and they kind of prioritize things. And so some things we actually put back. 
Now we would never, uh, you know, we don't sell artifacts. Uh, that is uh, certainly a, 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 a no-no uh, as far as archeological ethics goes. Uh, we, if, if you were to let it dry out, it would be destroyed. And if we break into the concretion, uh, everything inside will be destroyed unless we uh, preserve it. So if we have a, a, a whole bunch of nails, but we also have a, uh, a navigational device uh, in the same concretion and, we, and it's worth opening up that concretion to save that device, then we will go ahead and save the nails as well. So we, we, don't, we don't want to destroy anything we brought up because after all, this is a one of a kind object. You know, they're not gonna be make, making new Spanish galleons or they're not, you know, it's not, it's not a renewable resource uh, like natural resources can be. Uh, it's as endangered a species as there is. So, uh, you know, so we do put some thought and sometimes we'll put things back to the seafloor, but otherwise if we, it's kind of like if you break it, you buy it. If we break into it, we have to pay to preserve it. Perfect, awesome. Thank you. Sure. Um, so um, unfortunately we are out of time, but I did include my email on here and um, any of the other remaining questions, I see there's a few from Laura and let's see, we also had, I saw Robert. So um, if you could go ahead and please send those to us and we can still have those answered. Um, here is a, uh, our poll, if you could just take a couple minutes here to answer the questions. And then aside from that, we really appreciate everyone being here today and for your time, Chuck. And uh, this was a great first first run here. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, it was, we'll it was definitely my know. pleasure. I really love uh, participating in your guys' programming. Yep, appreciate the partnership too. Um, and then about our next lecture, it'll be on March 15th from three to four. And that will be featuring um, Julie Edwards from, um, which is the sustainability site lead from uh, Northrop Grumman. Mm -hmm. So that'll be another really great one too. Um, so basically um, look out on the gtmner.org website. I will put that in the chat box. And then we also have State of the Reserve going on, which is our big GTM annual event. And um, Caitlin Dietz, who's coordinating that, uh, will add information about that too. So lots of fun stuff going on, despite the state of things. <laughs> so thank you for your time, everyone. Um, I will leave this up here uh, so everyone can, uh, let's see if anybody else isn't finished with the questions. And then I guess aside from that, I take care, everyone. Is there uh, is there any way you could leave it on for a few more minutes? I, I'd mm -hmm. be happy to answer questions for folks who are interested Absolutely. to stay. Yeah, that's well, a great why, idea. Why don't, we, why don't we do that then? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure be there's idea. some good questions. If you guys sure. had some questions that you wanted answered, just stick around. Um, mm -hmm. We do have another question here from, sorry, I'm going to scroll up, from Robert Hack. He's asking, is poor visibility just due to sand or sometimes algae? Also, what depth of water were you working in for these wrecks? Uh, oh, those are good questions too. So uh, they, the wrecks tend to be shallow. So the storm wreck was uh, actually one of our deeper wrecks at about 25 feet deep. Uh, and the steamship's about the same uh, and the centerboard schooners is similar depths to that, I guess, maybe 20 to 25 feet. Uh, anniversary wreck is a little shallower. That might be 17 feet, depending at the tide. And it, it, our visibility problems seem to be uh, tied to uh, the muddy water that's coming out of the river system uh, with the tides. So we, we certainly, I, I haven't, I'm not really an algae specialist, but it doesn't seem that we have algae blooms or anything like that. Uh, but we can get really muddy, fluffy, fluffy mud on the bottom. And, uh, and that can be stirred up real easily. Sometimes it's just black down there. You go down and you might be able to see a little bit and then you cross this line and it's just black under there. Uh, so it seems to be, uh, you know, if, if we go through a real long period without rain, we might be more likely to have good visibility uh, because it's just not flushing as much mud out the rivers, but that, that seems to be what the problem is. And we're so close to shore as well. If we were further out, uh, it, it wouldn't, it'd probably be a lot better visibility.
Great answer. Yeah, we do like to tell people at GTM that our, wa our water isn't dirty. It's just very nutrient rich here. <laughs> Um, and then we had another question from Laura Kalfi. How do you preserve metal like axe or cannons and stuff that you showed? Um, and what happens if you don't? Well, oh, those are good questions too. So uh, if we don't preserve uh, almost anything from an underwater site, if you don't preserve it uh, using laboratory techniques, you're going to lose it. Uh, now that's not always true. So if you have something made out of lead, usually lead does okay if you let it dry out. And actually gold, uh, gold's the noblest metal, it doesn't corrode. Uh, so a gold coin, we cleaned it with a little vinegar just to get some of the marine growth off it and it looked brand new. Uh, the lead, we kind of rinse off and the lead, we might do some cleaning with a brush or something. Uh, but uh, anything that's iron, uh, copper, uh, bronze, anything like that, uh, silver, all of those have to undergo an electric uh, elect, electric treatment. So electrolysis, uh, where we run an electrical current through the object and it helps uh, um, uh, get the salts out of it essentially. So, uh, you know, an iron, like an iron ax head has been soaking in salt water for a hundred years or 200 years. If you let it dry out, uh, the salt crystals in the water are going to uh, actually damage the metal. As, as the water leaves, the salt goes from a fluid state to a, a crystallized state, and it physically damages uh, the object. So basically what it does to it, if you're looking at it, it, it starts to rust at a super accelerated rate. So we will instead keep it in a particular solution of chemicals, and we'll run electrical uh, current through it, and that will force the salts from the object into the water and we switch out that water we make a new solution and say the cannons uh, that we brought up for example took four years of that electrical treatment before we could dry them out so it takes a long time uh, and that's one of the reasons you know it, archaeology is expensive and especially underwater great thank you and we have another question from melissa milner how do you work with foreign nations whose blood and treasure is off our shore and consider the wrecks a grave site? Is that something you do through the US government or on your own? Uh, well, that's a good question, Melissa. Um, uh, that becomes an issue, particularly if the vessel is a warship. So, uh, you know, who owns the ship, the shipwreck today kind of depends on who owned it in the past and where it is. And so if the ship was a warship, so say uh, La Trinité, uh, which was a French warship, uh, it, 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 you know, it was captained by Jean Rabot, who founded uh, Fort Caroline in St. Augustine. Uh, when that ship was found, uh, it was brought to the attention of France and France said, this is our shipwreck and the federal courts agreed with them. They said, okay, this, it was a French, you know, belonged to the French government a few hundred years ago. Governments don't abandon their shipwrecks. And so it belongs to them. And so if, if they consider it a war grave, which if, if their you know, soldiers and sailors died on it, it is, uh, they would have to give us permission before we could do anything on that site. Uh, now, a ship like the Anniversary Wreck, uh, which was a merchant ship, or the Spring Break Wreck, uh, which was probably a merchant ship, uh, it, if it's in state waters or on state land, and it has been abandoned by its owners, which anything that's a few hundred years old and no one knows about it, no one knows where it is, that's considered abandoned legally, uh, then it, uh, it is up to the state to manage that shipwreck. And so for most of the sites we work, we have to get permits from the state of Florida uh, to do any kind of archeological research on a shipwreck site. And, and so I haven't, uh, you know, I have worked on a French ship uh, that belonged to the government of France. This wasn't in Florida, but it was in Texas. And uh, a French archaeologist came over and we worked with them and we met them and they met us. And an agreement was worked out between the US State Department and the Republic of France. Uh, that the same kind of thing has happened, say, with the Emmanuel Point shipwrecks in Pensacola, which are Spanish galleons that were owned by the king. So government owned uh, uh, vessels. Uh, and so there had to be some kind of dealing with uh, the government of Spain. So sometimes that kind of thing happens, but most of the shipwrecks we work on here are uh, are considered abandoned and they weren't owned uh, by a government, so we don't have to deal with another government o other than our own permitting agencies, other than the state of Florida. 
great information. All very good questions, everyone. Um, since we do have Chuck here for a little longer, if you would like to raise your hand as part of your um, Zoom control bar, you can have time for a verbal question if you don't prefer to type it in the chat box. So feel free, if you can't find that on your Zoom control, you can come off mute and start asking questions if you'd like. Oh, I may have answered all the questions. <laughs> they were really good questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And a great presentation too. That was super. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we love our partnership with uh, the Research Reserve and uh, you guys always have such, uh, you know, your audience has such great questions. So it's a lot of fun every time. Well, awesome. And then this um, lecture today was recorded if anybody wants to go back and refer to it um just to look at all those cool antiques and stuff um and then aside from that um that'll be it's uploaded on the gtm website under the education tab it will be after today um anyhow aside from that i think uh, thank you for joining everyone yeah thank you all thanks for giving us a little question time i'm sure folks appreciate that yeah yeah thank you for your time chuck we appreciate oh, of course it. and uh take care everyone Thank you. Thanks again. Bye.